Welcome everyone to uh, the second keynote for the Stereoscopic Displays and Applications Conference. Um, the title of the presentation is 3D Movie Rarities. Uh, the, um, the, the presenters um, are Bob Fermanick and Greg Kintz. Now, um, Bob's had a bit of a, just a health hiccup, so he wasn't able to travel at uh, um, rather uh, short notice. So um, Greg Kintz has uh, very kindly agreed to um, stand in as a, uh, a sole presenter rather than a joint presenter. <laughs> Greg Kintz has been working with 3D for, uh, um, well, he says nearly 15 years, but I'm sure it's more than that. But uh, It's been more than that. Yes. With the archive, yes. Oh, with the archive, of course, yes. yes. Um, uh, I've known uh, Greg since he was working for one of the TV stations uh, and... Uh, has been uh, keenly interested in 3D through all of that period <laughs> and uh, um, got involved with uh, um, Bob Fermanick and the 3D movie archive, sorry, the 3D film archive, and uh, has since been working on a number of restorations, including Dragonfly, Squadron, The Bubble, th the um, 3D rarities, which we're discussing today. And in fact, we've got some of that disc for the, um, some of the... Um, the awards that we're giving away on uh, on Wednesday afternoon, and also the mask. So uh, um, it's incredibly important work. Once you lose these films, they're gone forever. So uh, um, these are a, a very important part of the history of uh, stereoscopic imaging. So at that point, I'll hand over to Greg. Thank you. Hey, um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm the uh, technical director for the 3D Film Archive. And uh, Bob really does wish he could be here today. You know, he's the founder of the archive, and he started out, which we'll discuss later, um, back in the early 70s and 80s when 3D films were not being taken care of um, and considered a, uh, a bygone thing. Um, I'll do my best to try to stand in his shoes and convey the efforts that we continue to do to save these features and preserve our stereoscopic film heritage. Um, we both share an immense love and appreciation for this amazing art form and the, the dire need to uh, save these films. So let's get started. The first documented uh, public exhibition of a 3D feature took place on June 10th, 1915 at the New York Astor Theater in Times Square. Only three reels of test footage were shown and by all accounts, um, it was on a dual 35 millimeter projected system in anaglyphic form. The test footage was on nitrate stock, which nitrate uh, by today's standards is considered very flammable and not something you'd want to keep, keep around at least in uh, normal conditions. Uh, uh, original trade magazine reports indicate there were motion artifacts and most likely that was either due to the dual projection system being out of sync or it was due to original phasing issues in the original dual camera rig. Um, we'll probably never know um, the footage which was shot almost 101 years ago um, does not survive and unfortunately was not considered important by its uh, presenters. By 1922 uh, color film stocks which had been developed which allowed for anaglyphic printing on one strip of 35 millimeter film and there were a number of shorts shown theatrically in the mid-1920s. The first 3D feature ever was The Power of Love. Sadly, these pioneering stereoscopic productions are gone with the victim of studio apathy and, again, vo volatile uh, nitrate film stock, which was highly encouraged to be destroyed um, for a period of time. However, we have been able to preserve the earliest extant footage from the 1922 Kelly's Plasticon features. This remarkable 3D footage of Washington in New York City has been restored and extracted from the original anaglyph in left-right form and is now available on our 3D Rarities Blu-ray collection from Flickr Alley. Pardon the plug there. Um, the anaglyphic shorts were a novelty and fell out of favor by 1926. Not much was heard from 3D over the next decade, but exciting things were happening behind the scenes. Edward H. Land was a scientist and inventor, and he co-founded the Polaroid Com Co Corporation. He developed a new method of polarization that could be applied to motion picture film. 
leading to the first public exhibition of polarized 3D, which took place on January 30th, 1936 in New York City. The polarized 3D system demonstrated by land 80 years ago at its core is not too unlike the systems used today in IMAX film-based 3D presentation, which are still for the film-based uh, systems dual projection and linear polarized. The advent of polarized 3D projection allowed for sharper images with less potential crosstalk. It also introduced the possibility of full color stereoscopic images. It is this new beginning in 3D film history that we'll be looking at here soon in the first part of our presentation. Thrills for You was the first polarized 3D film shown on the West Coast when it opened here at the Golden Gate International Exhibition in May of 1940. And in a few minutes, after 75 years, it will return home and play here again. This Pennsylvania Railroad short was expertly photographed, and for a film shot in 1940, you'll quickly see how the early stereoscopic features expertly used 3D staging. They watched their parallax budget and overall framing in order to have 3D actually enhance a film versus simply being used as a gimmick. And uh, be sure to watch the last shot, even with the clever editing, um, you'll see that Norlin 3D camera rig is probably a little too close to the tracks. So uh, it's one of my favorites. The next feature in our presentation is New Dimensions, which is historically significant as the first domestic full-color polarized film. It opened in New York's World Fair in May 1940 and marked the first time a color polarized 3D film was shown publicly. The stop motion assembly of a full-size Plymouth took nine weeks to photograph and by the end of the fair in October of that year, 4.5 million viewers had seen the film. Regrettably, the elements for this entertaining and historically significant film were terribly neglected. In 1953, RKO acquired the rights and decided for theatrical release it would be edited down and the trims were discarded. The shortened version was released in the early 1950s as Motor Rhythm. 3D film founder Bob Fermanek rescued the only surviving left-right elements, but they were rapidly deteriorating with vinegar syndrome, a process that breaks down the base of the film and eventually destroys it. Knowing this was a vital, one-of-a-kind element and time was of the essence, Bob had wet gate 4K scans made of the archival element. That process ended up taking numerous passes to capture the short in its entirety because the scanner, which was a 4K wet gate scanner and one of the top in the country, was having problems due to the shrinkage as the film was deteriorating. So we had to do a number of passes to order in order to get the complete feature intact. In order to restore the film to its original 1940 version, Bob located the only surviving 1940 opening and closing sections in a 16 millimeter print. We have now restored and preserved New Dimensions in its original complete edit as first shown in the World's Fair in 1940. And on a side note, you'll see those bookend segments uh, having a slight drop in deterioration being from an archival element 35 millimeter, which is the main body of the feature, to the bookend segments, which are 16 millimeter. I should mention that both of the shorts you're about to see were done by John Norling and Jacob Leventhal, two pioneers whose work in stereoscopic motion picture of the field date back to the early 1920s. After the two shorts, I'll do a quick rundown on the archive's history, tell you some of the myths we've had to combat along the way, and I'll discuss some of our recent restoration projects. Seventy-five years ago, you know, looking as good as it does and, you know, the technical work done behind that. Um, jo oh, just, just a quick heads up. Um, if any of you guys are thinking about some of those amazing polarized tricks, don't tear up your glasses yet because we have some more coming up here soon. So, um, Going on, uh, the, the Golden Age features of the 1950s highlight a variety of comparisons in today's state-of-the-art 
3D digital fair, but each time period in 3D we feel is unique. The vintage 3D titles offered more parallax thanks to wider interaxial settings, and in addition, the 1940s and 50s features tended to have longer takes and not as rapid cut editing as today's features do, and that also allowed for wider parallaxes to be viewed more comfortably and easily and allowed for better staging. Contrary to popular cultural references that have existed since the early 1980s, every single one of the 1950s domestic golden age features were shot in polar in digital interlock, or not digital interlock, uh, interlock dual 35 millimeter 3D. In tradition of 3D public relations, it seems part of any upgrade in 3D technology has included an underlying need to dismiss all previous attempts. And to that end, we have strived to set the record straight. Most of the vintage 3D titles have had A-list stars such as John Wayne, Vincent Price, Robert Mitchum, Barbara Stanwyck, Dean Martin, and Jerry Lewis, Edward G. Robinson, and Rita Hayworth. Just to name a few, legendary directors also just a few, Raoul Walsh, Douglas Sirk, and Alfred Hitchcock all worked on 3D features. Typically, the production budgets were on par with their 2D counterparts, and even lower budgeted 3D features showed great thought and care in their 3D production values. The primary culprit in the rapid decline of the box office was the theatrical uh, projection. In the fall of 1953, Polaroid field studies determined that nearly 50% of all 3D presentations were either shown out of phase or out of sync. And to put that into further context, if you have a film one frame out of sync, that can already cause eye strain and irritation. You get two, two frames out of sync and then you start having some serious problems. And a number of features were actually halted midway through and run in 2D. And uh, the premiere theater, which Dial M for Murder ran at, for the reviewers, the 3D projectionist had issues, ran it out of sync, ran the other half flat, the reviewers tore it up, and Warner Brothers said, we advise that you run Dial M flat. So even the shutters um, on the projectors had to be precisely in phase. If they weren't in phase, as you've probably seen before, you, know, you can have a watery effect with motion. After the audience had been burnt out a few times, they were not, not ready to, about to go back and pay money and get more headaches. And Polaroid, to their credit, had worked on synchronizers and aids to help projectionists, but by that time, the damage had been done. Um, just to explain on how the uh, 3D archive began, um, in the 1970s, nearly a dozen Golden Age features were converted to anaglyphic form for a theatrical release, television broadcast, and home video on Betamax and VHS. The vastly inferior anaglyph conversions were simply easier to present and required far less technical expertise. And this began as early as the 1970s when Universal released It Came From Outer Space and Creature From the Black Lagoon. The plus side is you don't need a silver screen, you don't need special equipment. The downside, of course, is it was anaglyph. And as a result, the uh, surviving dual strip 35 millimeter prints began to disappear. And Bob had seen that trend in 1978. He was able to watch It Came From Outer Space in dual 35 millimeter in polarized 3D. And a year later, it ended up not being the case, but he was told there was a new print that only required um, cheap red and blue glasses and no special equipment was needed. So Bob, uh, starting in 1980, he recognized the disturbing trend to begin to do what the other studios had not the foresight to do. He began actively seeking out and preserving these precious dual strip prints and elements, often at great cost and personal expense. He accumulated a large number of left-right prints in order to assemble a complete, a complete 3D pair. And to spell that out even better, the left-right prints had a soundtrack, so they could literally be split apart for second-run theaters, and you doubled your amount of uh, prints for a given title. 
And in the process, sometimes real one and real two might be left, then it goes to right. And in, in uh, situations where there were no 3D elements available, Bob would buy a prints in the hopes of finding a given reel. He accumulated a large number of left-right prints um, in the effort to assemble a complete 3D pairs, as many were separated, as I mentioned, in their, in their 2D run. Many of Bob's discoveries and restorations are still one of a kind and would not survive today if it wasn't for his efforts and ultimate creation of the 3D film archive. By 2003, the 50th anniversary of the 3D boom, the archive held the largest collection of vintage stereoscopic film elements in the world. Our collective goal has always been the same, to not only preserve these titles, but to have them available to the public and presented better than ever before, without the constraints of analog film alignment issues. What once took several optical generations on film can now be done better and with no loss of quality in the digital realm. The same applies for left-right level matching, which was harder to achieve in the film domain. Each of our 3D restorations has literally been a shot-by-shot -shot alignment, alignment corrections, fixing not only vertical and sizing issues, but also addressing various geometric distortions that could be introduced by the camera rig or somewhere in the post-production chain. Titles that we have restored include The Bubble, Dragonfly Squadron, The Mask, 3D Rarities, and more to follow. All are currently available on 3D Blu-ray. We've worked with and advised various studios on their stereoscopic assets. Our most recent restoration was also our toughest. You'll soon see a sample of the obstacles that we had to face on our last, latest restoration, which is a 1954 sci-fi drama called Gog. And it actually goes further than our restoration efforts in that the, uh, the film, uh, the rights to it were sold just a few years after it ran in 1954. And as a result of that, the original uh, left eye camera negative and all remaining elements were destroyed. And Bob Fermanek in I want to say 2000, 2001, almost 50 years after the feature first ran in 3D, discovered the sole surviving uh, left eye print. That was the good news. The bad news was the left eye was in path A color, which for anybody out there who's into film, know, they know that path A uh, fades and fades badly. So when we had a chance to, uh, to do our restoration, we knew we were going to have a daunting task ahead of us, and you'll see that here soon. Um, and following the GOG restoration demo is an outstanding Ann Miller sequence from the classic 1954 MGM musical Kiss Me Kate. It's a it was a tremendous box office hit, and we are proud to consult with Warner Brothers on this restoration. Kate is available on 3D Blu-ray and is highly recommended thanks to the hard work of Ned Price in the Warner Brothers Motion Picture Imaging Division. Hi, my name is Greg Kintz. I am the technical director for the 3D Film Archive. I hope you have your 3D glasses handy as we go through some of the hurdles we went through restoring the 1954 3D classic, GOG. Hi, I'm Bob Fermanac, founder of the 3D Film Archive. Like all of the 1950s 3D films, GOG was shot in dual strip 35 millimeter and exhibited in dual projection 35mm in polarized 3D. It was filmed with the Natural Vision 3D rig, which was used to film such 3D classics as Buona Devil, House of Wax, The Charge at Feather River, and several others. The plus side of twin 35mm 3D is the quality is essentially the same as standard 2D 35mm, and either of the two release prints can easily be shown in flat if needed. This was also the downfall, as both left-right release prints and archival elements could easily be split up, or one side of the master elements could eventually be discarded. This ended up being the sad case for GOG, where after its initial run in 1954, all 35mm left eye prints and archival elements would essentially disappear. Outside of some very compromised 16mm elements, 
literally all high quality left eye 35 millimeter elements of this feature were considered lost for almost 50 years. In 2001, we found the only surviving 35 millimeter left side element of God. It was an original 1954 Pathé color release print and it was totally faded red. That left side was paired up with a right side print that had better color and it was shown in 3D for the first time in more than half a century at the World 3D Film Expo in Hollywood. Director Herbert L. Strzok was very proud of his work on the film. Much like the one-eyed director Andre de Toth, Herbert Strzok suffered from monocular vision. And because of this, he relied heavily on Lothrop Worth for overall stereoscopic compositions and advice. In later interviews, Lothrop Worth would consider this one of his best 3D features. By the time God went into production in September of 1953, the natural vision rigs had their viewfinders configured for widescreen framing and many of the technical issues found in earlier natural vision features had been resolved. Again, paralleling the feature House of Wax, Lothrop Worth made sure that Gog relied on well-thought-out stereoscopic parameters such as staging, color, and camera positioning to highlight depth while still utilizing out-of-screen effects that were weaved into the storyline. After its original theatrical run in vibrant color, widescreen 3D, Gog suffered through less than ideal presentations in the upcoming decades, often being shown on television in black and white, improperly framed and taken from subpar prints. It was never again shown in proper widescreen or 3D. The recovery of this lost left 35mm element was a true cause for celebration, but it was also very apparent that this left eye print was turning pink and any trace of remaining color was fading rapidly. In 2015, the Archive was asked by Kino Lorber to begin restoration work for a 3D Blu-ray release, and we requested new scans. The last transfer of the right eye had been done in the 1990s in standard definition, so Kino was able to secure MGM's archival right side IP for a new HD scan. MGM had recognized the need to preserve this 35mm left side and with the cooperation of David Packard and the UCLA Film and Television Archive, they were able to make a new scan of the last 35mm left print. God was shown on television in a modified, full-frame, flat, black-and-white version. And it was obvious that that was never the intended aspect ratio. When we did new scans of the archival elements, microphones, set pieces, and various hard-matted stock shots shown that the film was clearly intended for widescreen presentation. With some finesse, the archival right eye IP print cleaned up extremely well, but the left eye print was in bad shape, and simply borrowing color from the right eye was not an option. Using our various stereoscopic recovery methods, which we've refined over the last 15 years, we worked first on recovering some basic color back into the left eye side and then spent considerable passes refining that process. While it is not always a 100% match, I'm sure you'll agree the end result was nevertheless a night and day difference over the original surviving left eye release print. We've also worked on recovering some lost blown out detail that is present in MGM's right eye interpositive archival element. Another unique trait that only survives in the left eye release print is an additional 3D production credit during the opening titles that is absent in all other surviving elements. This omission has been reinstated into the restored 3D and 2D versions. In late August of 53, interest in 3D was starting to decline, primarily from sloppy presentations. Shortly before cameras rolled on GOG, Gunsberg suggested to producers that all 3D features begin with flat titles. This would help projectionists to frame left-right prints correctly and a reduced chance of eye strain. Both the left and right eye elements had their share of dirt and damage sections as well, and thanks to the additional assistance of Thad Komorowski, these issues have largely been eliminated. When I was a kid, seeing Gog in 3D was a holy grail. The only way you could see it at that time on television was flat, black and white, full frame, and it robbed the film of all the special qualities that make it such a high quality and unique 3D feature. When we found the print in 2001, we weren't sure we could ever restore the color to it and bring it back to the quality that exists now. 
So it's a real thrill for Greg Kintz and myself to be able to present God to you as Herbert L. Strzok and his entire creative team intended. Thank you very much and enjoy God. Good stuff. Yeah, in my opinion, Kiss Me Kate's one of the best 3D movies from the 50s. Um, right now, I'll open this up for questions. Well, uh, I might just finish off by saying this is, uh, we're so privileged to be able to see these old features better than they were ever seen in theatres. So uh, thank you for the work you do, and please join me in thanking uh, Greg for his presentation. <laughs>